Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Educational AD Podcast. We'll be right back with today's guest. But as always, we want to give a shout out to our sponsors. Now, don't hit that fast forward button. These are companies that I used as an athletic director. You should really be using them, too. So take the next three minutes. Listen to our shout outs. You'll be glad you did. Here we go. We want to thank Sideline Interactive for their support of the podcast. Go to sidelineinteractive.com and you can schedule a live web demonstration and see their indoor score tables and scoreboards in action. Their products not only generate income for your athletic department, but they also create the ultimate game day experience for your student athletes. Probably one of the best purchases I ever made was our Sideline Interactive indoor score table. Go to sidelineinteractive.com for more information. We also want to say thanks to Hometown Ticketing, the leading digital ticketing provider to schools and colleges. I don't think I need to say anything more, but if you go to hometownticketing.com, their team is going to get you set up selling your tickets online. That's hometownticketing.com. Check them out. We also want to say thanks to Vital Signs Wall of Fame. If you're looking for a really cool way to display your school record boards for all the teams, for all the sports, or your school's Hall of Fame, Go to vitalsignswalloffame.com. Their interactive touch screen, that's right, touch screen video consoles are very, very cool and very affordable. Mention the podcast, you'll get a nice discount. That's vitalsignswalloffame.com. We also want to say thanks to Snap Raise. Have you ever spent uh, days and weeks with a fundraising platform and ended up with little, if any, return? Stop right here. Go to snapraise.com slash EDAD, hands down the best online fundraiser out there. It works. Go to their website. Also check out their platforms, including uh, Snap Sponsor, Snap Manage, a really cool one called FanX. You'll find it all at snapraise.com. We also want to say thanks to Home Campus. Go to homecampus.com as an athletic director. I used Home Campus every single day, and they're the official high school and state association management platform for our podcast. There's scheduling, there's uploading all the forms with eligibility and clearance. You'll find it all at homecampus.com. We also want to say thanks to Gipper, the official social media graphics solution for the podcast. If you go to gipper.com, their team is going to help you create world-class marketing content that will help you celebrate your athletes and promote your teams. Gipper is used and trusted by over 3,000 athletic programs across the country. It's professional graphic design made simple. How simple? Even I can do it. Go to gipper.com to get started. We also want to say thanks to Huddle. Go to huddle.com. Change the way you see the game. As a football coach, I used Huddle for years. But when I became an athletic director, I made sure that our school was a huddle school. And our coaches just loved the tools that huddle provided that let them coach our kids up to their highest level. Go to huddle.com, join the 8 million users, and turn your school into a huddle school. And we want to thank Athletic Surveys by Lifetrack. Go to athleticsurveys.com, their team is going to create a custom survey that lets you take the pulse of your student athletes and your parents. ADs already hear back from the complainers, the people that want to gripe. Athletic surveys will connect you to that group, but they'll also connect you to the 98% that supports your program. And that's a tremendously valuable tool to have when you're talking with a frustrated parent or your principal or your school board. Go to athleticsurveys.com. Let them help you take your athletic program from good to great. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Educational AD Podcast. We've done this a couple times in our 500-plus interviews. Uh, we're going to the other side of the desk, and our guest today is Doug Loftus. You know, I've met Doug several years ago through another um, part of education. We'll talk about that, but Doug's got an incredible background. He is a longtime educator in the state of Florida. He's a retired principal. 
He's also got a, uh, a second career. Uh, you know, I'm into podcasting. Doug is a professional announcer. He does local, regional, state, and national competitions as a public address announcer. Just a fantastic guy to work with. And uh, we're excited to have him on the podcast. So Doug Loftus, welcome to the Educational AD Podcast. Thank you so much, Jake. And I do appreciate this opportunity. And I can't wait to, uh, again, just give some insight and, and uh, throw some knowledge out there perhaps and um, also learn. You know, one of the things that I can uh, always take away from any of uh, the meetings that I go to is what can I do to become better as a human being, a better person, and to also serve. And, uh, and this is a great opportunity to have this platform. Well, uh, we appreciate you taking time to come on. We're, we'll try to hold up our end of that equation and uh, provide you with something. But we always like to let our listeners have a chance to get to know our guests. So give us that quick bio where you were born, uh, you know, where you went to high school. Maybe take us up through your own college days and then we'll take a break. But uh, as I like to say, what's the Doug Loftus origin story? So um, we'll start with the beginning and it's, and it's, and it's kind of a, um, and I'll take on this strange and, and weird path. I was born in Arlington, Virginia, and my dad worked for the United States government. So we traveled almost like a, in a nomadic life. We lived in Panama. We lived in Caracas, Venezuela. My dad spoke uh, fluent Spanish. So he uh, was able to teach um, m me and my brothers, you know, the, the language. So my Spanish is not that great, but I can get by. But living in those two countries, um, just gave me a, a whole new appreciation of our country because whenever we would move back, you know, from, from Panama or from, from Venezuela, um, you realize that, wow, you know, we have so much to be thankful for to live here as compared to other countries around the world. So I grew up mainly in Virginia and in South Florida. You know, my dad would bounce back and forth between um, headquarters up in Washington, D.C. and in Miami. Um, went to middle school and uh, high school in, uh, in South Florida. Um, my high school alma mater is Chaminade Madonna High School, and they happened to win the state yep. football championship um, this, past, uh, this past weekend. So very proud of that and uh, very proud to be a, an alum of uh, Chaminade Madonna, which is in Hollywood, Florida. So for those that are listening, Chaminade is right there on the uh, corner of uh, – uh, 46th Ave and Hollywood Boulevard. So <laughs> I give a little shout out to the Lions of Chaminade. I ended up uh, getting a, a scholarship in track and field and I ran for the Seminoles of Florida State. And uh, my specialty in track and field was the 800 meters. And when uh, the head coach was desperate and they needed someone to run the 400, they would, you know, he would call on me to run the relay. So, you know, running alongside Olympians and you know, world-class athletes and NCAA champions. It was a thrill. Um, ended up getting my degree in education at Florida State University. And I started teaching um, at a Catholic school in South Florida uh, for one year. And then I moved up to Orlando and I taught physical education and science at a middle school for a couple of years. And then I moved my, my way into uh, Edgewater High School in Orlando and taught science and uh, life management skills, which is, I don't think is even on the, on the docket anymore. But I was also the head girls track coach at Edgewater High School for several years. And then during that interim, I was also um, given the opportunity to be the head coach at UCF. So I was the head cross country and track coach for the University of Central Florida from 1992 to 1995. And I enjoyed uh, working in that capacity, but um, during that time, I was also going for my master's degree in education leadership. So around 1996, uh, when I got my degree, um, I started to pull away from track and field and coaching and decided to uh, pursue administration. So from 1996 on up until 2023, um, I was an administrator. Yeah. Uh, and again, for our listeners, Doug's got a tremendous resume in education and in sports, as you, as you have already heard. I want to go back to those high school days. You know, I'm a little bit older than you, but we're from a similar era. Uh, what was your experience back in high school, you know, as a student athlete? What are some things that just 
really stick out for you, some key memories or moments that are still impacting you today? I think one of the things that I remember most is my coach, you know, the relationship that I had with my coach. Um, and he was a hard-nosed football coach turned track and field coach. So he was always using that football verbiage, so to speak, to get me going on the track. But um, he made me a stronger person because of the fact that he saw the, uh, the talent that I had as an athlete, but deep down inside the relationship that I had with him and also with the other athletes on the team, I couldn't have asked for a better, a better experience because um, being from a small high school, we competed against other high schools, other public high schools uh, in South Florida. And as you know, Jake, there's a wealth of talent um, down there. So you, you pretty much had to prove to yourself, you know, on the field, on the court, on the track, that you were worthy of competing against the schools in South Florida. So um, that my coach, my high school coach prepared us for that. You know, just because we were a small school didn't mean that we were less talented. Um, on the contrary, we had some very talented athletes at my high school and they moved on to run, you know, at their respective colleges. So the oh, relationship on that was fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you already mentioned that, you know, you got a scholarship to run at Florida State University Division One. How was that transition for you? Uh, you know, uh, and you mentioned you there's a lot of uh, talented runners there. Uh, was it, uh, you know, an eye opener? Uh, did you feel like, you know, hey, I belong here? You know, what was that like coming in from, say, a small school to now, you know, Division One college? Uh, that's a great question. I'll tell you, one of the things that I remember my freshman year, I kept doubting myself, asking, do I, do I belong in this arena? Do I belong with these athletes that are running head and shoulders above me in regards to their accomplishments? And it took me an entire year to adjust. And I remember having conversations with my track coach at Florida State, and he would share with me that, you know, you're good enough, but you're lacking confidence. And it took me a year to adjust to the program. Plus I was moving up in distance. I was a sprinter in high school. So um, they moved me up, the coach moved me up, moved me up to the 800 meters. And well, today it's more of a sprint these days, but back then it was pretty much, you know, running two laps and, and trying to finish as hard as you can. So that one year transition was difficult. Um, and it was also a, uh, an experience for me that um, again, made me stronger as a person, made me believe in myself. And also um, I had the opportunity to, to learn from, you know, some, some gold medalists that ran in the 1984 Olympics. And it gave me the opportunity to train with some of the best in the world. So, you know, I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for all the opportunities that I've had over the uh, course of my career. Yeah, that had to be a cool experience, you know, uh, coming in. I think anybody would have been a little starstruck. Uh, but then, as you said, the confidence was gained, uh, the respect was earned, and now you're part of a team. Uh, very right. cool stuff. Yeah. For our listeners, once again, our guest today is Doug Loftus, longtime educator and principal here in the state of Florida, uh, experienced coach and a professional announcer. We're going to hear about all of that and more, uh, but we're going to take our first break. So please stay with us. This is the Educational AD Podcast. Very cool. We want to say thanks to our good friends at Sideline Interactive Indoor Score Tables and Video Boards. Go to sidelineinteractive.com and you can schedule a live web demo to see their score tables and their score boards in action. Probably one of the best purchases I ever made as an AD was our Sideline Interactive Indoor Score Table. Of course, we use it for home games, but we also used it for pep rallies, for signing ceremonies. Their products are tremendously versatile, and their customer service is just outstanding. Go to sidelineinteractive.com. Schedule that live web demo today. We also want to say thanks to our good friends at Hometown Ticketing, the leading digital ticketing provider to schools and colleges. I don't think I need to say anything more, but if you go to hometownticketing.com, their team is going to show you how to set up and sell tickets to your events, not just athletic events, but things like school plays, concerts, school dances, even graduation. And here's the best part. Every school 
gets assigned a dedicated client success manager that's going to provide you hands-on support every step of the way. That's every step of the way. Go to hometownticketing.com. Make the change to online ticketing. Hometown. More support, more security, more customization. Hometownticketing.com. Welcome back, everybody, to the Educational AD Podcast. Once again, our guest is Doug Loftus. Uh, he's a longtime principal, longtime coach, uh, now a professional announcer in his uh, so-called retired years. Doug, um, you talked about how your coaching journey you know, took you up to Orlando. Uh, you actually coached at University of Central Florida. But at that same time, you were working on your administrative credential. What was the motivation behind that? You know, why were you feeling administration might be your calling? So basically, you know, um, as you are well, well aware, Jake, you know, um, teacher salaries are not the best. And uh, Tammy and I, my wife, we were looking at starting a family. And one of the things that I uh, noticed is that if I become an administrator, that perhaps we can support, you know, uh, my wife and support the kids if we have kids, which we do. We have two, uh, two amazing daughters uh, and they're both educators as a matter of fact. So I got into administration basically for financial reasons. Um, I wasn't really happy with what I was making in terms of uh, being a teacher. And honestly, it was just the fact that I wanted to uh, be able to financially support my future family. But strangely enough, as I got into administration, um, I started to think, okay, what can I do holistically at this school? Can I, can I just look at it from the standpoint of just being a teacher or do I need to look at it from being an administrator's purview? And I realized that being an administrator, you have such a, um, a huge impact when it comes to the climate and the culture of the school. And that really got me jazzed up. I thought, wow, if I can just make, you know, the culture and the climate of the school become even better than what it is now, how cool would that be? Instead of being confined in the classroom, start using my talent, for lack of a better word, my talent to help move the school forward. So that got my juices going and my energy started to, uh, to increase because I was so involved with everything and not to be a micromanager. That was the last thing that I wanted to be, but I just wanted to be involved and help out and serve and do the best I can to, to improve the culture and the climate of any school that I happen to serve as a leader. And basically the motivation at first was financial, but I continued to see how much of an impact I could make being an administrator, more so than being in the classroom and being confined with just a, a small group of students. So um, the motivation really became ethereal for me not so much financial but more spiritual and more ethereal in a way in terms of helping out the school in a broader sense oh absolutely and again people that go into education whether it's teaching and coaching or administration you're not doing it for the money okay right. uh you know we all have to survive we have to pay those bills and if it was about money we'd all be doing different things Definitely. but uh uh, again, education is is very much a calling. Now you were coaching. You were also coaching at UCF. What was that first uh, administrator job? And you know what? Looking back, you know what was that experience like? So while I was coaching at UCF, I was also working in the dean's office, helping out our dean students, you know, with discipline issues. So I was wearing a lot of hats during that time. Um, Edgewater High School is not close to UCF in terms of geographics. I would have to drive 45 minutes from the high school over to the campus. So uh, basically, I had to put all of my energy into being a teacher, being a, a quasi-dean, and then putting on a different cap, driving over to UCF, and then coaching. So uh, during that time, it was, okay, what's Doug Loftus going to do? Is he going to be a coach for the rest of his life, or is he going to be an administrator for the rest of his career? So basically it was a matter of, um, you know, wondering how am I going to continue to do this particular schedule without burning myself out? And burnout is always an issue, right? We always talk about, you know, teachers leaving the profession because of various reasons. 
And I didn't want to be that. I wanted to be a person that could still contribute, that would contribute no matter what, um, what avenue I chose. So I chose administration because, again, basically it was a financial reason. But as things turned out, um, I realized, like you said, Jake, it wasn't about the money. It was about making an impact. So the, the initial test for me was working with the dean of students and understanding the nuances of that particular role. And then understanding that how a dean interacts with the student is critical because the dean has to have a special gift. They have to be able to talk to the student and then also talk to the parent. And boy, did I learn so much from the deans that I worked with at Edge, Edgewater High School that I thought, wow, if you have a, a great dean of students that can work with students and work with parents, that's golden. Yeah, uh, I, again, I, I'm right there with you. I actually served as our dean of students for two years at one of the schools I was at. Our, we had gone through like four deans in five years. And uh, the faculty actually came to me and asked if I would consider becoming the dean. They thought my, uh, uh, you mentioned football coach mentality. They thought that was what our school needed. Anyway, I did it for two years and just really had a great time. Uh, we had two great principals I worked with. I was still the football coach, so that was nice. Uh, but then I was approached by another school to become their athletic director. And I realized I liked being a dean. But I love being an athletic director. Uh, but you're absolutely right. It, it is a, a special job and uh, and it has its own rewards. Um, tell us a little bit about the, your first principal's job. Uh, you know, how did that happen? And um, again, looking back, you know, what are your thoughts on it? Awesome. So my first principal's gig was back in 2006. And um the movie Saving Private Ryan came out about five years prior, and that movie has resonated with me ever since. And my first day on the job at Corner Lake Middle School, which is out east over toward the Cape, uh, near Cape Canaveral, it's the easternmost middle school in Orange County. So my first day on the job, I was thinking about the pressure of being a principal, and I thought, wow, this is, this is crazy. You know, here I am. New, new guy, new kid on the block, so to speak. And this is my first day on the job. And then I reverted back to the movie Saving Private Ryan in my brain. And I realized this is not pressure. This is an opportunity for me. The pressure that those 18 and 19 year old kids had had when they were storming the beaches of Normandy and having a 50, 50, less than a 50% chance of, of surviving that first day, that's pressure. And so I was able to take a deep breath and, and come to my senses and realize I'm not experiencing the pressure like my dad experienced when he served in the war. So it put, it put everything in the, into perspective in regards to my first day as a principal. Was there pressure? Of course there was pressure to perform. Was it life and death? Absolutely not. So having that, that understanding of what pressure really means gave me a sense of understanding that being a principal is an opportunity, not so much a life and death situation. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, and again, you mentioned middle school. I spent my first few years as a teacher and a coach at the middle school level. And, and that's another, uh, let's say a very special environment uh, for educators, you know, and very right. cool stuff. You have, you, you almost have to have a, a, a a demented sense of humor, I guess, to be in the middle school arena because you're dealing with students. And as you know, Jake, you're dealing with students that are still trying to figure themselves out. Adolescents, you know, at the age of 11, um, all the way up to the age of 16, because, you know, you do have students that are 16 years old that may have failed their third grade year due to the dreaded FSAs or the FCAT. And so, you know, you have a, um, a wide range of, uh, of an age group that you're dealing with. So, you know, it's a matter of understanding, you know, and knowing your audience, so to speak, and how to deal with the adolescents in middle school. And one of the things that I can share with you about being a principal at a middle school, the most rewarding is seeing a young man or a young woman or a boy or girl, I should say, come out of high, out of, out of the middle school and say to me, Mr. Loftus, I want to be a doctor because I had a great teacher in science. 
And I'm like, this is fantastic. That's, that's the name of the game right there. That is what you want to hear. And even at the high school level, when you have seniors that graduate that they want to be an engineer because they had a great physics teacher. Um, that just makes my heart glow. It just, it helps. It, it makes me realize the why. Why do I do this? Why am I doing this as, a, as an administrator? When I talk to students and they tell me that they have a goal in mind, that's my why. Yeah. Now, a great reminder for our listeners, you know, athletic directors, we're trying to put together a team of coaches to get those types of responses, you know, at the end of the product. As a principal, you're doing that on a much grander scale for the entire school. You're trying to put together that team of educators, which includes coaches. And we're going to talk about that in our next segment, the relationship uh, that goes both ways between athletic director and principal. Let's go and take another break. Uh, once again, our guest is Doug Loftus, longtime principal educator here in the state of Florida, also a professional announcer. We're going to hear about that too. Let's go and take that break. This is the Educational AD Podcast. We want to thank our good friends at Vital Signs Wall of Fame for their support. If you're looking for a really cool way to display your school record boards uh, or your school's Hall of Fame, go to vitalsignswalloffame.com. Check out their interactive touchscreen video consoles. It's a great way to show off everything about your athletic department, but it's also a great way to tell the unique stories about your school's history and your proudest moments. Like I said, go to vitalsignswalloffame.com. They're touchscreen consoles. You, you got to see it to believe it. That's vitalsignswalloffame.com. We also want to th thank our friends at Snap Mobile. That's the parent company. Snap Raise is the site I want you to go to. Have you ever spent days or even weeks with a fundraiser that ended up providing little, if any, return? Stop right here. Go to snapraise.com, hands down the best online fundraiser out there. We used it at our school with great success. Our coaches loved it. Our parents loved it. Our uh, finance officer <laughs> loved it. Uh, basically, it works. Go to snapraise.com. You can also check out their other platforms like Snap Store, Snap Manage, a uh, really cool one called FanX. As I said, it's all at snapraise.com. Check them out today. <laughs> Once again, welcome back to the Educational AD Podcast. Doug, uh, we've had a couple of principals on previously, and I'm always curious to hear your perspective, you know, athletic directors, I think anybody can, can get tunnel vision on. Uh, and I think sometimes athletic directors forget that uh, it's not, you know, the John F. Kennedy athletic department, it's the John F. Kennedy high school and the athletic director, the athletic department's part of it. What are some things that you look for as a principal, maybe when you're hiring an AD or, You've already hired them, and now you're working with them. Uh, what would you say are some best practices that our listeners can learn from? I appreciate this question. I've had the wonderful opportunity of having three outstanding athletic directors during the course of my career. Um, one, unfortunately, passed away a few years ago. But all three of them had one common denominator, and they were student-centered. Um, you know, we as principals have a tendency, and it's unfortunate, even even the veteran principals have a tendency of looking at the athletic director as uh, checking eligibilities, making sure that the uh, the sheets that are sent to, you know, the FHSAA or whatever district office that they have to go to, principals have that tendency of, oh, they're just doing their job. That's perfect. Well, that's not the case, because knowing the three athletic directors that I had the fortunate opportunity to work with and serve, there were more than that. What they did is they were um, mentors. They were um, relationship builders. They fostered um, a, a family atmosphere among, amongst the uh, coaches. Um, they had accountability meetings with the coaches. And as the principal, um, I noticed that the three athletic directors that I happened to serve 
they would always share with me their thoughts and concerns. It was an open door policy on both ends. When I would you know, share my concerns with the athletic directors, they would come back and share their concerns with me. But I think in a nutshell, the athletic director is more than just the paperwork that the athletic director is involved with. A good athletic director, in my humble opinion, is someone who's able to foster relationships with their coaches and with the athletes. And then on top of that, I think principals, and yeah, principals in particular need to understand a lot of athletic directors do more than just what they do. For instance, two of the three athletic directors that I happen to have the honor to serve also helped out with lunch duty. They also helped out with bus duty and drop off and pick up. So they were more than willing to do beyond the scope of their, of their job. So I was blessed in that sense. But to answer your question about what I'm looking for, you know, in regards to um, a solid athletic director, is someone who's able to communicate um, honestly with their coaching staff, foster relationship with them, and then also build the relationship and the trust um, among the coaches and among the players. I'll give you one, one short example. We had an athletic director at Colonial High School and she was amazing. And when we were talking about um, a very tough loss at a football game, she came up to me and she said, you know, Doug, I'm going to have to talk to the players because they're pretty down about this loss. And it was a a very, very important game for us. Um, But she went into the uh, locker room and she spoke to the players and the players came out talking to me afterwards and they couldn't believe what she had to say to the players. Basically, it was she loved them. She cared for them. And the players walked away with dignity. And I said to myself, how lucky am I to have an athletic director that's able to talk to the players and have that open mind going into the locker room and speaking to them about, you know, how much pain she felt for them. So it was, it was an incredible experience. So I'm, I'm hoping that I'm not, you know, bantering too much or going off tangent, but I think that's one of the things that I can share with you as a principal is looking for someone that has, the ability to foster relationships. Oh, no, absolutely. Uh, and I think any AD or coach listening, uh, you know, th- that's their goal. They want want to have, you know, that ability to relate and talk to students beyond, you know, the X's and the O's. Um, I'm going to ask you a loaded question here. So um, pretend you're not, and I have no idea how you're going to answer this. You may tell me to go jump <laughs> in the lake. Okay. Um, but pretend you're not. Uh, pretend your audience is not athletic directors. Pretend it is principals. What would you say to principals about the importance of hiring a teacher coach, as opposed to that teacher? And I'm exaggerating. That when the three o'clock bell hits, they're out the door, and you don't see them anymore till the next day. Uh, so. If I'm understanding your question correctly, I think that what I would do and what I would share with the principals is, of course, you know, academics comes first. You know, if if you are here to teach and you want to be a coach, understand that you're going to put your emphasis on teaching. Because when you have an athlete that's in your classroom and that athlete is struggling uh, and is not able to maintain his or her eligibility due to his or her GPA, then I'm looking for that teacher that's going to have that sidebar conversation with that student. And I would like to hear what the teacher would say to that student and and share that information back to me once that teacher has that conversation. And believe it or not, there are several instances that I can share with you where teachers have had conversations with students whether it was academic or behavior, um, teachers would come up to me and say, Doug, I I need some help. I need some help with this particular student because he's not getting it in terms of what I'm saying to him or what I'm, what I'm trying to share with that athlete or that, with that student. And then I would always come back and say, well, here's what we can do. Um, Why don't we show that student what he can do instead of focusing so much on the negative that he's not doing what he's supposed to be doing show that student what he can do so that he can become a better student and also ultimately become a better athlete. You know, when I was in college, 
you know, my first year, I was a horrible student uh, because, again, it was about self-confidence and not doing the right thing. And it wasn't until I had an honest conversation with my college track coach in which he told me, Doug, you can run. We know that. But you're not going to run for Florida State if your grades continue to plummet. Well, that was a motivator for me to get me back on track and help me out. Um, but I think if I were to talk to a teacher and the teacher happened to come up to me and say, I'm not getting through to this student, um, the first thing that I would say is, well, let's talk about what he does right. Let's see if we can give him at least a, a carrot that he can chew on a little bit so that he will be motivated to do better in your class. You know, of course, the old sandwich principle is, is, is effective, positive, negative, positive, you know, and, and, I, and I firmly believe in that. So start off with something where you can say, all right, you're doing good in this particular portion of the class. Let's see if we can work on this part. Now that you have the formula, Johnny, let's go out there and let's perform. Let's do what you got to do so that you can maintain your eligibility. So again, I think right down to the wire, Jake, and every, every conversation that we've had thus far, it all comes down to how you interact with the students. No, absolutely. And uh, I, I want to make clear that absolutely we are education first. Uh, they are student athletes. Uh, you know, they're not athletes. Uh, and that uh, the teacher has that opportunity to impact a kid in many ways like the coach does. But uh, as you know, when you've got that teacher who is also a coach or even a club advisor or somebody that's adding something to the life of the school. There's just so many different opportunities that they can connect with that kid. You know, they might not connect with them in chemistry, but they can connect with them in sports or as a assistant coach or as a advisor to the chess club or whatever it is. So can uh, I add something else to this, Jake, and it's one, oh yeah. one thing, and the word is empathy which is uh, a Greek word meaning to suffer. And so, you know, I think the principal needs to show a little bit of empathy to the teacher and a little bit of empathy, not a little bit, a lot of empathy to the teacher and then also to the athletic directors. Because if we are not um, seeing what they're seeing, meaning if we're not understanding the difficulties that an athletic director faces or a teacher happens to face, then why are we in the position that we're in? I think it's important that as a principal or any administrator for that matter, has an understanding and can empathize with what the athletic director is faced with. Because we all know for darn sure that accountability is, is rampant. Well, you know, we talk to our teachers about making sure that the students are, are prepared for the FSAs and the EOCs that are coming upon at the end of the school year. And we talk to our athletic directors and make sure they have conversations with the coaches. But you know, the bottom line is the principal has to be there to show a little bit of empathy for the athletic director who may be uncomfortable talking to a coach. You know, that, that might be a courageous conversation that that athletic director is going to have with the coach. So therefore the principal has to understand that this could be a difficult conversation and the principal has to be there to support. And as a support system as well, not just to, you know, talk the talk, but also be there to to guide the athletic director if need be. And I'm glad you brought that up. You and I talked about this off air, but um, I I heard and I kind of think I saw as a coach who is becoming an AD. I, I heard it from ADs, but um, it was our job as athletic directors to keep all the negative stuff off of your desk. Okay, you know, eligibility, grades, parents, etc. You know, you're doing your job if the principal's not calling you and saying, what the heck is this? What's this phone call I got? Um, and at the same time, you know, you alluded to it. It's the principal's job to support and back the athletic director, but both of them have that responsibility to communicate with each other and make sure that it is a relationship that they're not both in their silos, as we say. So, exactly. Uh, great and stuff. You, and on top of that, as an athletic director, there's so much, that is thrown on top of them that if you have a good athletic director, you don't want to lose them. You don't want to lose that athletic director to 
another school or that athletic director chooses to go back to the classroom or gets out of education altogether. Because the AD at any school pretty much sets the tone when it comes to the athletic department, when it comes to athletics in general. If the AD happens to be someone where other coaches say, you know what, that person, that AD has got my back. Like you said, Jake, it, it keeps it off the principal's desk. But I welcome any athletic director that happens to, to pursue um, this particular career to be someone who can serve others. That is something that I think athletic directors should have internally. It's in their soul. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to do this at the end of the podcast, but if one of our listeners, principal or AD, uh, wanted to reach out and pick your brain a little bit more, what's the best way they can get a hold of Doug Loftus? Sure, they can send me an email. And uh, my email is um, dloftus800 at gmail.com. Okay. dloftus800 at gmail.com. And we'll give that out again at the end of the podcast. We're going to take another break, but when we come back, I mentioned that uh, Doug also has, uh, whether it's a second career or a third chapter, as I like to refer to it, uh, he's a professional announcer of the highest level. So uh, we're going to hear a little bit about that, how it might apply to your uh, school and your athletic director department. So let's take that break, but we're coming back. There'll be more on the Educational AD Podcast. We want to thank our good friends at Home Campus for their support of the podcast. Go to homecampus.com. They are the official high school and state association management platform for us. It's also your one-stop platform for things like scheduling, all the things that go into athletic eligibility and clearance. You can even have parents upload forms directly. Uh, you can track your coaches. It's just an incredible platform. I used it every day when I was an athletic director, and it was just great. And the home campus team was great to work with, too. As I mentioned, all you have to do to get started is go to homecampus.com. That's homecampus.com. We also want to thank Gipper for their support. Gipper's the official social media graphics solution for the podcast. And if you go to gipper.com, their team is going to show you how to create professional quality social media posts for your website. Um, it's so easy, even I can use it. Gipper's going to help you celebrate your team's accomplishments and promote your athletes. It's used and trusted by over 3,000 athletic programs across the country, and you should be part of the Gipper team. Go to gipper.com, mention the podcast, and you'll get a nice discount. That's gipper.com. Start creating world-class content for your school's social media channel. And we want to say thanks to Huddle. Go to huddle.com and change the way you see the game. As a football coach, I used Huddle for years, and it was just great. But when I became an athletic director, I made sure that our school was a Huddle school, and our coaches just loved the tools that Huddle provided that let them coach our kids up to the highest level. Go to huddle.com, join the 8 million users, and turn your school into a huddle school. Welcome back, everybody, to the Educational AD Podcast. You know, I first met Doug uh, a number of years ago. Uh, I was still in AD, but I was working as an official. Uh, I think it was actually at a college meet, but, you know, I've seen him at college and high school meets uh, frequently over the last several years. Um, Doug, how did you get started in announcing for uh, sports events? And, um, you know, just, just kind of share with our listeners where uh, that has taken you. Uh, that's a great question. The, the word serendipity comes to mind. So the, the state track and field championships were held in Winter Park. And of course, Edgewater High School is very close to, to Winter Park High School. And um, I was one of the uh, track and field officials, a young 30 something track and field official working at the state meet. And uh, the meet director happened to get together with all the officials and stated that the announcer was sick. Does anybody want to give announcing a shot? So being a young 
person. I raised my hand. I'll give it a whirl. And so from 1995 um, up until present day, I've been announcing track and field meets. Now, whether it's at the local level or the, uh, the collegiate level or the uh, national level, um, my, my first gig was at Winter Park High School at Showalter Field, where the state track and field championships were held there for, for many, many years. And uh, so that's where I got my start. Somebody came up to me afterwards and said, Doug, you did a pretty good job, you know, announcing the state track and field championships. Um, would you continue? Would you mind doing that, you know, down the road some? And I said, sure. It's going to be a little bit, you know, of a difficult um, process for me because I was starting my leadership career and I was going into, you know, the dean and assistant principal and principal world. So whenever I had the opportunity to, get some time off, I would try to announce, you know, some of the meets locally. And then as um, time went on, um, I was invited to announce the, uh, the collegiate meets uh, at Florida State. Of course, that's my alma mater, uh, the University of Florida, UCF, which is, again, another one of my schools that I happen to coach. Um, and that's also my alma mater. So um, ultimately, it just, it just it's taken me to places where I would never have imagined. And uh, I'm grateful for that. And on top of that, having, we just talked about this at commercial break about professional learning. And I had the opportunity to work at the NCAA Indoor Track and Field Championships up in Birmingham with one of the best announcers in the world. And um, I thought I was well prepared for uh, announcing this particular meet. After all, this is the NCAA Championships. But this announcer was great. And he shared with me some of his secrets, um, his toolbox, so to speak. And I walked away thinking, okay, if I need, if I want to be like him, like this person, I need to brush up on my skills. But again, I can't, I can't say enough about the fact that I'm so grateful with the opportunities that I've had over the years to, to work with fellow announcers, to work with you, Jake, in particular. Um, I can't, I can't say enough about what you do for the sport. One of the funny stories I can share with you is this. Um, when I was announcing one of the state track and field meets up in Jacksonville, I had a little bit of a break. So I went down to the pole vault area and while I was watching the, the girls pole vaulting, I went up to one of the coaches and I said, you know, you're, you're an athlete over there. She's doing quite well. You know, she might, you know, she might win this whole competition. Now I just walked, I just walked down from the press box from the announcer's booth just to have this conversation with the coach. And the coach replied, yeah, my athlete's doing well, but if that darn announcer would just shut up. Maybe she'll do a better job. <laughs> and I said, well, coach, that's me talking. And he goes, oh, I'm so sorry, Doug. I didn't mean to, uh, you know, be rude to you. And I'm like, don't worry about it. I, you know, so it's one of those funny stories that, you know, sometimes we announcers have a tendency to talk maybe too much. But uh, again, it's a learning process. And I can't say enough about how grateful I am to have this opportunity and more opportunities down the road, hopefully. <laughs> well, um, as someone who has uh, announced a fair share of games as an AD, you know, when that announcer doesn't show up for your soccer game or your basketball game, well, guess what? You know, the AD is going to grab the mic. Uh, and as someone who's heard you many, many times, uh, I, I can state uh, without hesitation that uh, I, I think you do a wonderful job it's not an easy job but having a good announcer and again i hear you primarily at cross country and, and track and field events championship events um i think you do a great job you are informative you're knowledgeable uh you do your homework uh and i i don't think i've ever felt or said to anyone else Boy, I wish Doug would be quiet because it, it is a fine line between providing information and there's a lot of information going on as they track meet uh, and being that um, that person uh, who just thinks it's about them and the microphone rather than the event. So, you no, know, athletic directors listening, they know exactly what I'm talking about because uh, they they're, they probably have an announcer for one of their sports like that. But no, uh, you do a great job. Uh, talk a little bit about that prep, say, for a state track meet. Uh, 
again, you just do a, a marvelous job of weaving stories. And I'm going to add this and then I'm going to shut up. Um, <laughs> you come out of the booth with the portable mic and you catch the runners after they've crossed the finish line, after they finish their event, after they finish the pole vault, and you let them tell their story, uh, just like it's ESPN or or Wide World of Sports. Uh, so, uh, talk a little bit about that preparation. Sure. Going back to that announcer that I worked with at the NCAA championship, the one thing that he shared with me was this: Doug, let the athletes speak. And what he meant by that was let them perform on the track, let them perform on the field. They will do the speaking. You don't have to say anything. It's an obvious thing that you watch when you see the athlete set a, a national best or a world a world record. So you don't have to necessarily belabor the point. Um, the athletes will do the speaking. So if you interfere with that, it dilutes that performance. So when I go down and I start interviewing the athletes after the race is over or after their event is completed, um, the questions that I ask are very simple. Um, and it's basically, you know, how did you feel about today? Uh, tell me what your training is going to look like down the road. But I give the athletes a heads up prior to putting them on the mic so they're not as nervous. So it's, a, it's basically me prepping them so that they won't stumble over their answer. So it's basically just, you know, understanding the fact that the athletes are doing the talking while they're competing. And if you happen to talk too much or you're over talking, throughout the competition, then it does distract the performance. So it's, it's one of those, you know, secrets, I guess, for lack of a better word, um, you let the athletes perform and that's how they speak. Yeah. But again, it's just so great uh, over the course of those uh, state track meets, which are all day affairs. Uh, and here in Florida, we do them four days in a row. We have four classifications. So it's back to back to back to back uh, events. Um, and again, you just do a wonderful job. Uh, it's always a pleasure to work with you. Um, we're going to uh, go into our final segment, which uh, we call the athletic director's toolbox. Now we've already established you are not an athletic director, but you certainly know your way around the world of athletics and you've seen some, uh, let's say some world-class ADs. Before we do, we're going to take a quick break, but when we come back, I'm going to challenge you to send out a brand new athletic director on their very first job, but I'm only going to let you put three tools in their toolbox. So let's hear from Athletic Surveys, who sponsor this segment, and when we return, we're going to find out what Doug Loftus is going to put into his new athletic director toolbox. We'll be right back. We want to say thanks to Athletic Surveys by Lifetrack for sponsoring the AD Toolbox segment. At my schools, we use surveys for just about everything, for kids, for parents, for coaches, for teachers. And the information that came back was almost always positive, but it also included some squeaky wheel concerns. Uh, athletic directors already hear back from those parents anyway, but doing a survey uh, particularly one from athletic surveys, they connect you to those squeaky wheels, but they also connect you to the 98% that support your program. And that's a tremendously valuable piece of information to have when you're talking with a frustrated parent or a frustrated student athlete, or even your principal or your school board. Go to athleticsurveys.com. They're going to create a custom survey that lets you take the pulse of your players and your student athletes. That's athleticsurveys.com. Let them help you take your athletic program from good to great. Well, it's that time of the podcast. We have been visiting today with Doug Loftus, a good friend, a longtime principal here in the state of Florida, also a professional announcer. Doug, uh, you're not an athletic director, but you have been around school-based athletic programs pretty much your entire life. So uh, right now I'm going to challenge you to send out a brand new athletic director on their very first job, but I'm only going to let you put three things in their toolbox. So what three items are going to go into your new athletic director toolbox? I think the first one is more conceptual. And I think 
when I have a conversation with the new athletic director, I'd like to have the new athletic director meet with each individual coach and ask these three questions. What's going well in your program? What needs to improve? And how can I, as the athletic director, help you? So each individual coach would have a meeting with the athletic director. And then the second thing that I would share with the athletic director is do not put all your marbles in the revenue generated sports, if there is such a thing these days. Put your energy equally among all of the athletic teams. Go to the athletic events. Go to some of the away events, especially if that school is close to your home. What better way to send a message of support to your coaches when you go to away meets or to away games? I mean, if it's convenient for you and you have a school that's right down the street and your own school is playing that school, why not just head on over there and spend maybe a, the first half or the first quarter of the game and just, you know, be there with the coach and, you know, have, have your face be present so that the coach knows that you're there to support him or her, you know, while they're coaching. And the third thing, and this is something that I've seen athletic, athletic directors do, um, take advantage of the opportunity of doing something outside of, of the athletics. In other words, when you are a new athletic director, what I'd like to see you do is maybe pick up a mop pick up a broom, sweep up the gym. That will be something where the coach will be, oh, he does value me. He does value me as a person. He values me as a coach. Because if the athletic director will do something like that, that sends a huge message to anybody, including the coach. And when the coach happens to see that, and that's a, that's a, that's a palpable, that's a, that's a, tangible um, approach when it comes to supporting that department. So the three things, one is, you know, have that uh, meaningful conversation with each coach, what's going well, what's, what needs to improve, you know, what, uh, what can I do to help you out? Second thing is go to every single game if you can at all possible, show your face and be there for the coaches, whether it's, and if it's an, if it's an away game and it's close to home, Go to the games because then that coach will be like, wow, he's there for, or she's there for me, and I'm at an away game. And then the final thing, which might be the most important, do something that's outside of athletics. Sweep the gym, mop the floors, you know, that will help the custodians as well. And it gives the coach the feeling of, oh, I'm, I feel valued because he's really helping my program out by doing something outside of the realm of his, uh, of his uh, responsibilities. So those are the three that I would impart to uh, a new athletic director. Oh, I, I love them all. Um, and it all comes back to a, a theme that you shared earlier on is, you know, being there for the students, being there, being a servant leader, you know, the kids, the school, and again, your departments uh, wrapped up in that great stuff. Doug, thanks so much for sharing. Uh, again, it's always great to hang out with you. Um, one more time, if one of our listeners wanted to reach out and connect with you, what's the best way they can get a hold of Doug Loftus? Absolutely. So my email address is dloftus, and I'll spell it. It's D as in dog, L O F as in Frank, T as in Tom, U S as in Sam, 800 at gmail.com. dloftus800 at gmail.com. Doug, thanks again for sharing with our listeners. Uh, we're entering kind of a quiet time for us as far as uh, uh, cross country's over and track hasn't begun, but I know uh, we will see you on the uh, on the track meet schedule this coming uh, year in 2024. So um, looking forward to that. Absolutely. And the feeling is the same, Jake. And I do appreciate this opportunity. I thank you so much for uh, this time and I'm grateful for you and and uh, thank you to all the listeners out there. And I hope I have given you some uh, some noteworthy uh, advice. And um, if you need to contact me, please do so at your convenience. Uh, again, listeners, you got a great resource here. So uh, I'm going to see if I can do it from memory. D Loftus 800 at gmail.com. Perfect. All right. Perfect. Well, Doug, thanks again. Listeners, thank you. Um, as you know, we upload our Zoom recordings to the Educational AD Podcast YouTube channel. 
We appreciate you listening. Come back next time for another great interview on the Educational AD Podcast.